Um, while the United States population is a mere 4.4 percent of the world's population, its incarceration accounts for 22 percent of the world's prison population. So this is where some of my students from Kentucky might be like, yeah, we're number one, and I'll have to explain them that <laughs> being number one is not always a good thing. Uh, yeah. Um, right. Now, now this is, you, you take or leave this, 78.4% we, we, of people incarcerated have been sentenced. This could be a good thing or a bad thing. On the one hand, it means that due process was done. Um, on the other hand, it might mean that we're just really good at putting people away. Uh, it's a little column A, a little column B. For, for reference, Libya has the worst record. They've only sentenced 10% of the people they've incarcerated. So 90% of people in prison in Libya have not actually been sentenced there. Um, so that's just a, just, a, just a reference point. Now, we do also have a federal conviction rate of 93%, so let us not be, yeah, I know it's pretty high, right? Yeah, <laughs> you're, you're also getting A in, in throwing people away. Um, so that 78.4%, those are the people who have been sentenced. The ones that have not are in jail waiting trial. And with a 93% conviction rate, then their chances of ending up in prison are actually pretty high too. So I, I think it's, um, Pretty, it's a pretty big number, a pretty dire situation. Um, and recidivism, which is, anybody ever see um, Bottle Rocket, the movie? No? Oh, no Coen Brother fans in there? Uh, there's a, there's a, a quote in there about recidivism, it's about, and it's funny, it's about, rep, it, it's, it's funny because the person keeps asking it and it's about rep, repetition. Uh, but it's about repeating an offense, repeat offenders. Re recidivism is the rate at which someone will be tried, convicted, punished, and then go out and do the same thing again, or something similar, okay? Um, recidivism in the United States is also bad. Um, it's 67% of persons released from prison. Um, that includes people who are paroled and people who have timed out, so they had a sentence that they, they served the whole time. 67% um, of those people will be reincarcerated within five years. Um, now, there are, some, there are some instances where I think this is more of a social systemic problem. And we can talk about that after. It's not actually what my paper is going to be on. Um, and you'll notice that the federal prisons um, and the state prisons have, I might have had that switched actually. I think it might be, I think it might be better for the state. I think I might have that. No, no, actually I'm wrong. No, that's right, that's right. I'm wrong that I'm right, okay. Uh, <laughs> so, but it's, it's, it's a lot and it's overwhelming when you think about it. Now, I first wrote about this in 2006 when I had never set foot in a prison and I was a graduate student trying to desperately publish just to be able to qualify for a job. And I did this research um, based on other people's research and, of course, my own studying of Aristotle. And I do still stand by what I say essentially in this article, but I'm going to talk about some things I changed my opinion of because I started to teach in prison. Um, and so if you're interested in the article, that's one that I was saying is free on academia.edu. Um, just understand that I've changed a little bit of my views towards the end because I, I, I learned some hard truths. Um, I also acknowledge that there are many systemic problems that account for these statistics, none of which will be helped by me today. I'm sorry. So if you came here for the solution to mass incarceration, I don't have it. Um, but the systemic um, issues that you should be aware of, and you might want to go to the library and look them up, um, are things like racism, other forms of hatred, profiteering, the war on drugs, and in general, an ins insatiable desire for retribution and lack of compassion and mercy. And what I mean by that last one is that we, um, we Americans tend to really want to see people get punished and punished pretty harshly um, compa compared to other countries. Uh, so these are all things that we should address. And today I'm only going to be talking about a very small part of the population and a very small part of what the prison system purports to be trying to do. Uh, so today I only hope to discuss how Aristotle can be used to help us um, really rehabilitate people who are in fact guilty of horrific crimes and they are as people dysfunctional or maybe even worse, maybe evil. Uh, it turns out that's actually not a lot of people in prison. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's why I start off with these disclaimers and caveats. Um, uh, this is not a fear mongering campaign, I promise you that we lock up a lot of people that are perfectly fine and probably wouldn't hurt you at all. Um, but uh, this paper is not about them. All right, so um, Aristotle was a virtue ethicist. And so he focused on what type of person you should be rather than trying to figure out what you ought to do. A lot of ethicists are saying, oh, what's the right thing? Is lying wrong? Is it ever right? Aristotle says, look, 
Situations are complicated. Sometimes it might be right, sometimes it might not. Let's try to be the kind of person who would have wisdom who would actually know what to do in difficult situations. So rather than focusing on memorizing any rules, sorry, Ten Commandments, um, you know, rather than that, let's, let's find somebody we think is a moral exemplar and imitate them and follow them and try to be like them and become the kind of person who has good judgment about what to do in, in difficult situations. That means that you're gonna have practical wisdom, hopefully, by the time that you're done becoming a good person. Um, and virtues are practiced and acquired dispositions to think and act in certain ways under certain circumstances. So you're trying to become the kind of person, think of it like a Yoda or something, you're trying to become the kind of person where when you are faced with a dilemma, you actually have a lot of the good principles and thoughts and, and ends and desires and hopes for humanity that would give you the right answer even if it's a completely new problem, because we find new problems all the time. Humans are good at that. Now, nobody is born virtuous, so that, that's a shame, a lot of work. But nobody's born vicious either, so that's good. So it's like the good with the bad. Now, moral virtue is something that we don't get to learn through books. Um, it's also not something we learn through conversation. So again, sorry if anybody thought they're gonna be virtuous by the end of this hour. It's gonna take a little longer. It takes habituation, says Aristotle. It's gonna take practice. And we, use, we like to use the skill analogy. Like developing a skill, something like riding a bike, or gymnastics, or building a house, or playing the flute. <coughs> Virtue has to be <coughs> attempted repeatedly in order for it to be understood and acquired. And so how do you learn to ride a bike? Well, you get on the bike and you fall off a bunch and you just keep trying, and then eventually you get it. And so this is something that you might think is <coughs> obvious, like duh, but Philosophers think this is pretty interesting because all the other ways we learn, things like with induction, things like um, mathematics, you start from something you know and then you deduce from that something else. And this is the one kind of knowledge, what we call know-how, where you just have to pull up your bootstraps and try. And you will probably fail, and failing is part of the learning process. Um, and so it's, it's, it's one of those things that Aristotle would say, you know, I can't explain why, but this happens. We see an experience. People get better through trying. It does, you know, how do you become just? By doing just actions. Well, a lot of people will criticize him and say, well, how do I do a just action if I'm not a just person? He's like, try. Just, <laughs> you know, pretty much what, you know, my mother used to say to me when I would ask her, you know, how to spell a word, and she would say, look it up in the dictionary. And I said, well, I can't look it up. I don't know how to spell it. She's like, try. She was right. So, <laughs> so as silly as it sounded to me at the time, Listen to mom. Now Aristotle thinks that virtue is really relative to the thing we're talking about. So like what it is to be a good computer or to be a good pair of scissors or to be a good human being is gonna depend on the kind of thing you are. So he gives us what we call the function argument. A thing is good when it fulfills its characteristic function well. So a good flute player is one who plays the flute well. Good pair of scissors, what are scissors for? Cutting, so if they cut well, they're good scissors. So what's the function of the human being? Yeah, well, the function of human being has to be unique to us, right? Um, life and perception are shared by all other organisms, says Aristotle. So it's not like our function is just to eat and sleep, right? Wouldn't that be nice? Turns out that Aristotle thinks reason is unique to human beings. And so our function would be to reason well on this model. So the human good or virtue consists in excellent rational activity, says Aristotle. Now, Reason's funny because it's got two things that it does. Um, it has an intellectual side where it tries to figure out the way things are, and it has a practical side where it tries to figure out what to do. And the practical side is very good because it can use imagination, it can think about like the ideal situation, even if it's not ideal, how do we get there? Whereas the intellectual side might just be the scientific side that tries to like, you know, learn about frogs and toads and math. Now, there are virtues for both things that reason does. There are intellectual virtues like curiosity and wisdom, um, and then there are moral virtues. And I'm just telling you this because I think that if you're interested, you should know more about the intellectual virtues, but I'm gonna now focus entirely on those moral ones. Um, they are distinguished by their subject matter. They're also distinguished by how you get them, right? Because your intellectual virtues just show up at school and study and learn. Moral virtues, again, you actually gotta do the thing a lot, over and over again. It's gonna be hard work. And it also has to do with the part of your soul that's involved. 
So please uh, excuse my, my childish ghost <laughs> picture of a soul. Um, for Aristotle, the soul is the life force of any being. And for the human being, we have three aspects. Animals would have the bottom two, and plants just have the very bottom. So plants have souls, is Aristotle, because they live. They're organic. They live in life force. And soul is whatever makes them grow and photosynthesize and make seeds. And animals have that, too. They have a digestive part, but they also have, you know, urges and desires. And, you know, this is why we have a picture of a dog pulling on, on a leash. It's a dog that hasn't really been trained to walk very well with its master yet. Um, and then reason, of course, is what makes us who we are. So our soul, the suke, that's why that word is there, it's Greek, the soul has these three aspects. Of course, the distinguishing one, the one we care about is reason. And reason has two functions. Now, the one, intellectual, it can do all by itself, right? But moral virtue is weird because it's a combination of appetite and reason. Because reason is supposed to figure out what the good is. And appetite is supposed to listen and say, okay, let's do that. Then you can already see where there's going to be a problem, right? <laughs> yeah, because yeah, knowing what to do and doing the right thing, they're totally different things, aren't they? Right? So, so Aristotle is going to say, look, when you're talking about the moral virtues, you've got to have, it, it, it's in a way a, a virtue of your appetite because it's mostly about being motivated to do the right thing, action matters. However, you know, you have to know some stuff. You have to have a good idea of like what's illegal and why, you know. And he does think that most people have an idea of, you know, there's a reason why you don't steal, stealing's bad, you know, in general. So um, in order to be a morally good person, reason has to be correct and appetite has to listen to it. Turns out that's not always gonna be the case for individuals. But let's talk about how we even get there. Aristotle says, moral virtue, you learn by habit. You just gotta pull up your bootstraps, start doing the things that good people do, and you'll figure it out. You'll start to understand why good people do it. You'll start to understand why it's good. So he says, look, this is pretty much the way human beings work when it comes to skills. You do something of a certain type. Maybe you don't like it so much at first, but you do it for whatever reason. And then you become used to it. We're creatures of habit. You've heard that before, right? Well, the more you become used to something, it's familiar and we like what's familiar. So by doing something more, you actually like it more too. And then of course, we get to this point, and this is kind of like when you're young, you kind of just do what you're told. And then you get to a point where you, you like doing it because it's what you're used to doing, it's what you've always done. And then you start to think, oh, this pleases me. And you know what I think? I think pleasure is good. Now, Aristotle is not going to be a hedonist. He's not going to say, live for pleasure. But he is going to say that, you know, whatever is good is pleasurable. Now, there are going to be some things that are pleasurable that are not good. Like, you know, you probably shouldn't live for heroin. It is pleasurable, not virtuous. So um, it's going to be one of those tricky things we have to get right. But it is true for Aristotle that when you live the good life, you should be happy. You should be pleased. You should be able to enjoy being virtuous. There should be benefits to that. And sometimes the benefits just are in knowing that you're good. Virtue is its own reward. But we first figure this out by, by realizing that we're pleased with what we're familiar. And so if it seems good, then we do it. But of course, if we do it, then we get more accustomed to it. So you can see how this cycle happens. And the reason why I have this picture here is just to show you that once you get on a course, it actually reinforces itself. And I like to tell students um, two things. One, I talk about how we can be made to like something we don't like. I usually tell my students this when they're complaining about how much reading I'm assigning. They're like, I don't like reading. I'm like, well, you just haven't ha made it a habit yet. You know, I'm, I'm talking to a select group here because you're all at the library, so you probably like reading already. But <laughs> Dig back in your memory when you were younger. You might not have liked it at first, right? It's the kind of thing that you have to, it's hard at first. You have to kind of do it. Um, for my students that haven't really done a lot of reading, I'll say, has anybody here ever done any long distance running? Anybody ever done, done long distance running in the room? No? Well, here's the thing that's weird about long distance running that, that you guys will know. The first time you run, it's horrible. Like for everybody. Was it horrible for you? Was it horrible for you the first time? I mean, no matter, uh, like, like nobody's born in shape to run a marathon. Nobody, 
right? It, it's not natural. It's horrible. Everybody has phlegm coughing up. They think they're going to go farther, and they're surprised at how, how early they want to stop. <laughs> you know, they, like we, we pretend it's not that bad, but it is, right? And then you do it over and over and over again, and after a while, something weird happens. You, not only are you better at it, but you kind of miss it. Like if you take a day off, you have soreness from not running. It's really interesting. You can actually go from something being horrible to it becoming horrible not to do it just because you did it a lot. And so in a lot of ways, that's what virtue is going to be like because it's not going to come easy and it's not going to come natural. You're not going to want to do the things you're supposed to do. And then there's this other thing where things that come really naturally, and because of that, they become habits fast. So things like sleeping and eating and, you know, no, it's just sleeping and eating, right? <laughs> um, those are real natural things. And once you get really good at them, like, they're really all you want to do. And this is something my, my undergrads definitely, they have this problem, right? <clears throat> and so the reason why this is so difficult is sometimes our appetite is already, you know, naturally inclined to eat and sleep. And then sometimes it's not, and it kind of needs reason to pull it along. So what ends up happening is reason can make appetite change, but appetite can also make reason change, and it depends on who's in charge for the long haul. And then Aristotle tells us that there are four basic kinds of character traits or character states you might end up in after a certain time of you know, repeating certain acts. So this is no longer like kids. We're talking about people like our age, like adults, you know? He says, look, if you're virtuous, if you've done everything you're supposed to do, you're living the life, you know what's good, you do what's good, and you do it easily, right? Because you feel appropriately about good. You want there to be justice. You want there to be, to be happiness. You want to make the world a better place. You do make the world a better place, and that makes you happy. Perfect, right? That, that's what he says we should be trying to go for. Now he says, there are a bunch of people that don't quite get there, and even the virtuous person was probably here first, right? Because you have to take a while. And this is what he calls continence, where you know what you're supposed to do, and you do it, but maybe you're kind of grumbling and kicking and screaming. You know, like you see somebody drop a wallet in front of you, and you know you should pick it up and chase after them and give it to them, and there's like a second of hesitation where you're like, but I don't, I, I could in theory just keep it, but then you get mad at yourself and you shake it off and you actually do the right thing, right? That's the continent person. The virtuous person, it wouldn't even occur to them to keep that wallet. The continent person kind of has to talk themselves out of it. And they do, but the fact that it kind of popped in their mind means they're not quite virtuous yet, you know? And then the incontinent person is the person who's like, I'm going to go get that wallet and chase that person and give it back to them. Oh, but I forgot running is horrible. I hate running. So, uh, oh, they're gone. I guess I'll keep it. <laughs> so you see how that happens. You know what's right. And here's the thing that's really weird for Aristotle that I actually think he's right about. The thoroughly vicious, like the really, really rotten, they actually don't know what's good. They, they know what you think is good, and they think you're a sucker, right? So they might think, yeah, other people say stealing is bad. Boy, are they idiots, you know? And it's because they believe that that I get to steal from them, you know? So the vicious person for Aristotle has done the wrong thing so much and it has become so fun for them that they just think it's the thing to do and the way to live and everybody else just must be mistaken. So the only person who knowingly does something wrong is the incontinent person. And there's plenty of those people Actually, Aristotle thinks that's the majority of us. But they're actually not the worst. There's hope for them. The worst is when you start to believe your own hype. Now, this is roughly, this is the unscientific stuff. I'm just telling you from what Aristotle says. This is what he would say a general population looks like, normal people. It's really hard to be virtuous, so there's not a whole lot of us there. That's that blue pie. It's also, I think, really hard to be vicious. Like, it takes a lot of self-deception to, to convince yourself that, you know, killing's fun and good. So, unfortunately, probably a few more of them than there are virtuous people because there's lots of ways you can be vicious. But still, in, in general, not that big a part of the population. And then we've got this part I call pre-character. Those are the kids who haven't really become one thing or another yet because we're not born either way. 
And then the red part is slightly more than half. That's the people who are incontinent, where we know better, but we kind of backslide, you know. Um, and then the, incontin then the continent are the green. So most people in the general population know the right thing. And about a, a little more than a quarter of them will actually do it. <laughs> um, and then, of course, the, the, I'm, I'm, I should mention, the, if we imagine children obey their parents and their parents are good, it's way more than that. Okay, so that's general population. Now, here's the unscientific guess of the moral condition of the prison population. Now, some of you might be surprised with my guess. Um, a lot of people think that the vicious are gonna just be the prison population. No, 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 in fact, the really, really good people at being vicious never get caught and do not go to jail and they work for Wall Street or something like that. So, um, they're very wealthy too. So. Um, the prison population, much like the general population, is mostly incontinent, and I'm assuming this based on the idea that they got caught, right? Um, there are some people that are tried as adults who are not adults, and they haven't really formed a character either way, and that's, that's sad when that happens. That, that's your, your kind of light tan <laughs> pie right there. Now, you'll notice I, I actually included some continent people and some virtuous people in there. You might be wondering why that is. Um, anybody want to know, anyone want to take a guess why that is? Wrongfully What's that? Wrongfully that's right. That's about the percentage of the prison population that's wrongfully convicted, and that's actually probably a conservative estimate. Uh, not so fun fact, 4% um, of death row cases have been shown to be innocently convicted people. That's 1 in 25. 1 in 25 people that are sentenced to death actually didn't do the thing they're going to be killed for in the United States. It's terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. So unfortunately, they're in there. Um, but I bring this up to show you there are more vicious people in there for sure. That, but there are some. There are plenty of vicious people that are not in there. Um, but this is to show you like the influence around somebody who's trying to be good. So let's say you're, you want to be better and you're in prison. You know your population is going to have a little bit of a different viewpoint on what's right. Now Aristotle also says that man by nature is a social animal, and he who lives alone is either a beast or a god. And he also tells us that we want to live with our friends, and our friends are definitely people with whom we have a lot in common. So the people that you're around, you know, because of habit, you're gonna do things with them, you're gonna to come to conclusions about what to do, you're gonna do the same kinds of things over and over again. So they end up being kind of the same kinds of people, right? Okay. And then imitation is the most natural thing in human beings, so if you're trying to be cool, you're gonna do whatever the cool person's doing. And this might explain why solitary confinement is one of the most feared and effective deterrent punishments used pervasively in prison settings. And it's also why, in my experience, when I've been in maximum men, men's maximum security prison, like almost no one does anything against the rules ever because you will be thrown in the hole and it is horrible. It, it, it doesn't seem horrible to somebody like me who like has students chasing me around all the time and I'm like, I just want some peace and quiet. But like, when you have the force peace and quiet and you don't get to read or do anything fun, it is in fact psychologically damaging, so much so that the UN has um, recently said that it's probably a form of torture and we should stop doing it. But the United States is not interested in listening to that. Um, but again, so if people are trying really, really hard to avoid solitary confinement so they can be with, with what was that? Um, with that, <laughs> which is mostly a bunch of people who are gonna screw up, right? Then that's their best bet. So just, just to give us an idea of, of, of why, why prison isn't really working. Okay. Now, the routine part of habit. Prison gets this right. Um, contrary to popular opinion, prisoners rarely sit around all day. In fact, in the prison that I'm at, all the prisoners have jobs. In fact, the whole prison is run by prisoners doing jobs, from cleaning to painting to having your own barber shop inside, because obviously you don't want to you know, max, maximum security. You can't just go down with great cuts and get your haircut. Um, to the food, um, and, and I, I have scare quotes around employing because I believe my guys make like 40 cents an hour. Because, interesting fact, the US Constitution, the amendment that outlawed slavery had a little bit of a caveat except for in prison, which is why they don't have to have a minimum wage. That's another unfun fact. Um, prisoners eat, sleep, shower, use the restroom, work, are counted, attend therapy service, and sometimes class at exactly the same time always. 
And I say the, the counted is like they actually have to be counted like several times a day and they have to be, you know, to make sure nobody's missing. Um, and when I say that they do things at the same time, I mean they walk at the same time. One, when I first started teaching, I, I had a lot of naive questions and I, I probably looked like a very stupid white girl. Um, when I first started teaching, I, I, you know, I would see that it was raining and I would see that the, the guards were walking the men towards where my classroom is. And I'm thinking, and I said to one of my um, colleagues who had taught before, I said, well, why aren't they running? They're getting soaked. And she looked at me, she said, Audrey, if they run, they're gonna get shot. And I was like, oh, right. So they aren't even able to briskly walk or like you can't walk too fast because then it looks like you're doing something funny and somebody in the guard will shoot you. This is in Tennessee, by the way, this is Nashville. Um, and if you're walking too slow, then you'll get in trouble for the guards because they're trying to sneak away. So they actually have it measured where they walk at the same pace and they can, they can time when they've left and they show up to the same place at exactly the same time every time they do it. You know, which is, which is, which is weird for me because I'm usually hustling because I'm always late. And it's like, well, I would not do well because <laughs> there is no hustling or else you'd be shot. Um, and I want to tell you a real quick story. I definitely am talking too long. I'm almost done. Um, institutionalization. So they got the habit thing right. They've, they've got this idea of people doing things at the same time all the time, but it's not going to actually work out. So John Brown is a former student of mine <clears throat> who was incarcerated for double murder for 42 years. And a miracle happened and he was paroled. And at the end of his parole hearing, when they announced that he was paroled, everyone was, everybody in his family was happy and everything. And he's like, oh guys, I got to go to Chow. And like he got very concerned that he wasn't gonna be where he's supposed to be for dinner. And people are like, John, you're you're gonna get out. And he's like, yeah, but chow. And and, and, and it's like it like it didn't sink in him. He's so institutionalized. And it was it was like now he laughs about it. He's like, yeah, I was so worried about missing sloppy Joe or something, <laughs> you know. But but it was like, oh my God, it's time, it's time, it's time. So the habit is real. I mean, the institutionalized habit is incredibly real. Even with getting the best news of his life. It, it, his habit took over his thinking. Um, yeah, so that, that was pretty sad at the time, but he's doing much better now and, and, and has a life like a human being. All right, so here's the problem I think that we have with the, mechanic, the mechanical problem. So Aristotle intended for children and those who cannot reason about the good well to be coerced into good behavior, but that was supposed to be just the starting point. It's not supposed to be the whole time, right? So only by doing what is good will their reason be awakened so that it can start to see the good on its own. But that's temporary. It's a phase of moral development. Aristotle expected eventually you would start to make choices on your own and choose the right thing because you're used to it. And what I think is happening is that in prison, um, choice is actually being taken away completely and brains are going to sleep until people are out. So in prison, prisoners follow rules and orders routinely simply because they're told to without explanation, sometimes for no explanation at all. I will tell you that I have heard of some crazy things that prisoners are supposed to do that make no sense at all. And I think sometimes it's just because they want to see how you know, I say jump, you say how high kind of thing. It's a kind of an abuse of power. Um, and then the only reward they get, because nothing is good in prison. I mean, a lot of people think prisoners don't suffer. I promise you they do. It is horrible. Nothing good in prison. The only reward they can aim at is getting out. But habituation requires doing the right thing and seeing a good result multiple times. Not, I'm gonna do what you tell me for 42 years and then I get my cookie. Because at that point, it's not even worth it. If, 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 you're not, if you haven't been convinced yet to be good. We are very lucky with people like John who were convinced to be good. Okay, so that's the only reward. So what I think we have to do is start thinking about habits of thought, not just mechanical, physical actions. Um, so prisoners are discouraged from making choices and reasoning through problems. Most actions are taken in a binary fashion, do what I'm told or else a whole. There's no explanation given, even if there is a good reason, there's never one given. Deferring your judgment to an external authority indefinitely can only make reason atrophy. So you are not asked what you think or what you wanna do about anything ever. Um, conversations and social time, that's why I have that pie chart, um, are likely to reinforce bad opinions and excuses. So, you know, the people who are like, you know, yeah, well, dealing drugs is the best job. Yeah, me too, I agree. Um, and then prisoners are completely unprepared mentally to make different judgments and choices when they get out. Or even if they are initially prepared, they're not really practiced 
at it. It's like they might have the right will, I want to do it, but they might not understand exactly how much they're going to be up against. And again, I'm talking about a very su small set of people. I'm talking about the people that actually recidivate like because of their own character. I'm not talking about the people who didn't get a job because of prejudice and all sorts of other things that are serious problems. Okay. Um, education. Previously in this article I gave you that, that you're gonna, you can get if you want, um, I said that education alone is not gonna work. Um, and I've since learned there's a difference between education of any type and higher education, especially in prisons. Um, they have a lot of education, like vocational education, GEDs, all that stuff is really important. But it turns out that that doesn't actually help people very much in not recidivating. Um, and essentially that's because that's just the baseline of everybody should have these, these skills. So um, it turns out that studies show that college level education in prison does change recidivism in the United States. And we know this. And the politicians who really like making money off prisons are ignoring it right now. Recent studies show that an exposure to college education inside reduces recidivism, recidivism by 40%. Oh my goodness. Students don't have to complete a degree or even receive credit for the coursework. By just taking college classes, your chance of recidivating goes down by 40%. We are not, we are not educating prisoners with college education classes. I volunteer. I can't give it away for free. I had to beg to be let in there. Um, why higher ed education? Here's my guesses. Critical thinking, learning while doing, completing projects, papers, etc., to solidify the knowledge and make it applicable to your real life. And then service learning is something that's been really popular in colleges now. So if you do a college class in prison, there will be something where you actually have to take what you've learned and do something to make the world a better place. And then you actually see the results of that and that's pretty empowering. And so that's the difference between a GED class and a college class. Also, when I teach, I bring my students from WKU. So half of my students are incarcerated. The other half are undergraduates. And they sit in the same room. They sit side by side. No guards, no chains, nothing. It's a real classroom. They get to act like humans for three hours once a week. And they will definitely behave in between because they do not want to miss out on that. If, they, if, they, if that gets taken away from them, it's, it's horrible. Um, and my, my inside students are, my outside students are actually pretty good too because a lot of them don't know a lot of, like, like people don't know this stuff because there are people that don't want you to. So I also think humanities, I'm a little biased, this is really unscientific, but I think that we need more humanities in prison. We need it everywhere. We need it everywhere, yeah. Um, I think subjects like philosophy, literature, history, art, political science, these are the things that study the human condition. And at the college level, students are expected to study, learn, and reflect on what they learn so that ultimately they have educated, informed opinions on a variety of subject matters that relate to human value. And I think when we're talking about people breaking bad habits to live well, it's a question of value, a question of values being inculcated and instilled. Digesting, rehearsing arguments, accounts, and stories awakens empathy and engaging in debate and goal-oriented project works makes it stick. I'm getting to the very end. Here, these are my very unscientific results. I've taught in the same men's maximum security prison since 2015. Um, I, these are the habituation projects we've had. We've had think tanks where they've raised money for charities. They taught teachers about the consequences for children of incarcerated people in public schools. They started a recidivism hotline where people who are paroled can call and get resources if they're, yeah, they did this all from inside. Um, We've done group work to solve social problems in class. I uh, make them teach something they've learned to another prisoner and then write a paper about it. We have in-class debates. Um, my, my WKU students will write them letters and ask them about things in prison they'll write back. I had one guy actually have a three hour meeting with his murder victim's son where um, it started out with the son basically telling him how he ruined his life and then ended in tears and a hug. And then I have a, a former student um, who was thoroughly evil when he got in in 1983. He was paroled in 2016. Now he negotiates gang ceasefires in Nashville and is a regular public speaker. Um, I've had the pleasure of teaching about 60 incarcerated students and I know more than a dozen who've been released since I've met them. I've only known of one that's been put back inside. 
So that's less than an 8% recidivism rate, I'll take it. Um, and that's why I say it's unscientific and I say future studies are needed because if we do the studies, at least we're getting teachers in the freaking jail. So let's just study this. So I, I, if people don't believe me, they say, oh, I don't think that's gonna work. I'll be like, you know what, you, you might be right. We should try it out and see. You should try it out and see. So that's really all I have to share with you. And I definitely talk too much and I'm willing to stay later if you guys are because mm -hmm. I love this and I have nothing better to do. <laughs> so what do you guys think? I'll shut up now. I talk too much. <laughs> Joe, you should facilitate. Any questions? Yeah. Um, so with the with Aristotle the heat theory, the mental training, especially since it's so hard to get people inside in the classroom. Did he ever give any kind of mental training tips. I'm thinking about the Stoics, how they have oh, yeah. all these ideas of, you know, think this way, try this, try that. Yeah. Uh, did Aristotle ever have something like that? Well, Can sure. I, I mean, um, maybe not as, and you know more about Stoicism probably than most people, maybe not as deliberate as the Stoics because they had journaling and whatnot, mm -hmm. um, like Marcus Aurelius. Um, but Aristotle, obviously had a school and um, I always tease my students when they complain about how you know I'm gonna be in college for four years and I'm like well Aristotle studied under Plato for 20 years and then he had his own school 20 years like so I mean back then the idea of, of intellectual like habituation of having debates and discussing and and making things applicable to real life and doing it over and over again um, there wasn't like you don't graduate from school back then. It was kind of like you stayed as long as you could afford it, unless you decided to open your own. So um, I think he just thought it was a lifelong thing you should be practicing. Yeah. At the time of Aristotle, would, would, would in, in Athens, were there any studios for for the heat? Oh yeah. Uh, well, okay, maybe not like what we have, right? So th there were, but. It's more like jail, like before trial, because a lot of the really bad crimes, you were either executed or exiled, which is sometimes almost the same thing, really. Um, and then of course, there was fines, so that you go to trial, you get fined, you have to pay your fines, right? So it was not like what we have. It's not like you could be sentenced, I don't believe. And I, and I, I need to double check that, because I'm starting to realize I might not know the answer fully, and I don't want to give you the wrong answer. Um, but as far from the from what I've studied, from things like Socrates' the trial and whatnot, um, it was not the idea to build a jail to throw people away. That's that's kind of a, a modern day thing um, mm -hmm. that we so got good at. Say no throwaway people. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, they also the they might have just executed them instead. So I mean, okay. like, because Socrates was executed for quote unquote. Um, believing in false gods and corrupting the youth. So, you know, I would be executed. I've definitely, <laughs> I've definitely messed up some minds. Um, so, <laughs> and I think for, for good, for better, but, um, but I, yeah, um, death penalty is probably like the first thing you want to eliminate before you start doing that. So, what do you guys think? You want to tell, tell us what you teach them, or oh my gosh, what you teach them, what you've been talking about? You will not believe it. My very first class, I had known them from this think tank thing first, and I had won this grant from the National Endowment for Humanities to design a course called "Why Are Bad People Bad." It's actually the title of the course. And when the guys asked me to teach. I gave them a list of all the things I taught, and I, I almost didn't tell them. I was like, oh, I teach Aristotle, Plato, blah, blah, blah. I was like, why are I so bad? And they were like, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> and they insisted I taught that. And I said to them, are you sure this isn't a little too close to home? And they said, we have so many ideas. I said, that's fair. And so I taught them theories of vice and why people are bad, and they were absolutely enthralled. We learned things from, you know, theological reasons to, are you guys familiar with like the Stanley Milgram um, shock therapy? Well, it's not the shock therapy, it's shock um, experiments where it turns out that 60% of human beings will, will believe that they will shock somebody to death just because somebody allowed lab coat told them to. Um, makes you kind of scared about, about how many people could be talked into doing something horrible. 
Um, you know, so, so they were very interested in this, and I think that in a lot of ways, learning those things is important to know how not to accidentally slip into them. I don't think people, I don't think a lot of people wake up and say, you know what, I want to be a rotten person. Like, I, I think most people who are rotten think they're, they're great, or they're just fine, or they're like everybody else. Yeah. So I taught them that, I also taught them social ethics, um, we talked about things from, you know, the debate about making children get vaccinated for measles, to gay marriage, to abortion. Um, they, they really liked that class. Um, we also, we did a reading group for a while where I was teaching them books that were kind of contemporary in the mainstream, so we read, anybody read Joshua Green's Moral Tribe? It's a great book, isn't it? They absolutely love that. They absolutely love it. That's where we, that's where we um, had to build a society and, and to fix social problems. Um, and I'm teaching them aerosols, ethics, and, and I always have a little aerosol because he's my favorite. So I always teach them this at some point, but I haven't had a class devoted to it until this August. I'm going to be teaching exclusively aerosol ethics. So I'm very excited to do that. Yeah. Um, I think it depends on who you talk to. Sure. But I believe we're all born virtuous. Oh, wow. Okay. Yes. You, you, have you ever heard of a guy named Rousseau? Yeah. yeah. Okay, because because you will like you feel like he has the same. He will agree with you. Go on. Yes. Um, I just believe that you know you look at a baby, mm -hmm. and they're so beautiful mm -hmm. and they're so sweet. How can you think they're anything but virtuous? Oh. And I believe all of us are born that way, regardless. I think. Well, we how would we that. ever get that? Well, maybe it's just I. I don't know. I can't answer that. I think we're all basically good. Okay. So, so what do you think when people do bad things? Do you think that um, that they don't mean to? Uh, maybe they were hurt in some way. Yeah, this is something we actually talk about in my in my why are bad people cl bad class um, because you know there's a there's um you might be interested in me talking about this the, the Confucian philosophers um Menzi and Sunzi yeah um, one of them believes that people are basically good and then they're corrupted. And then another one believes that they're basically bad and need to be like, you know, forced into doing the right thing. And the and and so um, Sunsi is the one that believes they need to be forced. He criticizes Menzi and he says, you know, well if they were born virtuous and they shouldn't have been able to fall out of virtue, how'd that happen? So that's that's the one challenge you'll have with that is if we are born good, then why aren't we all still good? Unless you think we all are still good, and then you have to explain, like, well, the, thing, the things that, I mean, like, genocide, pretty inarguably bad, right? Like, can we all agree? That's a, that's a rotten thing to do, and that is an understatement. Um, but it happens. So you have to ask yourself, like, how did that happen if we're all basically good? Like, where was the alternative way of acting and thinking introduced? Um, and I... Yes. And if you don't water the seed, it's in there like a plant or a vaccine. If it's in there, it's in you, it's going to be there. Why are bad things happening? It was your sour sauce. That's right. If it wasn't watered properly. Got to keep right. those habits yeah. up. That's right. Yeah. It's, it's like, so it, habits are like, you know, if you've ever done anything like running or weightlifting, you know, you can't get to your goal and say, ta-da, and then sit on the couch. It's gone in seconds, you know. Like that's the, the maintenance is the hard part, you know. Um, yes, that's right. Right. So you might say that we're born good, and then a bunch of us just let it go to the wayside. And I do think you're right. There are a lot of people who are good. Or maybe I should say what Aristotle might say is there are a lot of people who know what's good, and maybe they want to be good. But wanting to be good and being good are different ways, because you've got to have to do the work. Right? There's, there's an interesting thing here, and that's the the notion of effort. Yes. Of making an effort. Is making an effort something that is attractive? Is it uh, enjoyable? Is no. it a bother? Is yes. It, um, so I have a friend who was uh, in prison um, in Raleigh. This was a long, long time ago. And she was actually, um, her, her boyfriend uh, was the one who was committing the real crime. She was an accessory. Okay. He got off. She got two years or he got six months. She got two years. Uh, took the fall. Um, 
she actually engaged in a successful prison break, which I thought was pretty impressive. Oh my. And she was, she See, went back to that goes back to that business. you need to have the moral good and the intelligence, because otherwise the intelligence can do a lot of rotten things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she, was, she, was very, um, she was actually very, very morally good. And part of her, it, it, I mean, she was extremely poor. She was writing bad checks. It was dark. It was so, um, but she, it was because of her generosity of spirit, essentially, that she took the fall. You know, so a lot of, and sometimes it's a woman versus blah, blah, blah. But anyway, she couldn't read. So she had never had the opportunity to learn how to read. And even in the prison. They didn't teach her. There was no, so she got out in the literacy house and started working for him. And she died of VHS in one of the prisons. I'm so sorry. She was in the 30s. Oh, my God. um, She wrote that history. And she was so proud of herself. It was was truly remarkable. So I think that. You know, any kind of learning, really, if it's the kind that fosters like independence of thought, and um, I think that's something that, like you were saying, that we all need more of. Yeah. An opportunity to be creative, creative social thinkers. Yeah. And it's strange that you know maybe I'm just hearing it from one side because my university's in financial trouble and getting all sorts of bad criticism from politicians who think we should just become vocational. Um, I feel, I, I feel, uh, my, my major was under threat actually. They tried to, they tried to cancel a philosophy major. And we are, we are on the rebound. They were like, you know, I think we might be able to actually get it back. Um, but uh, th- there, are, there are a lot of people who think that we don't need humanities. And actually you have it on, you have it on the Facebook. Um, was it Jeff Sessions who said that, um, who, who was it that said, we need more plumbers, not philosophers. Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz. That's it. That's right. Okay. Ted Cruz. Yeah. Yeah. And then the funny thing was, of course, some philosophers wrote an op-ed after that and pointed out that if you major in philosophy, even if you don't go on to be a philosopher, that your lifelong earnings actually are exponentially much better than a plumber's, no matter what you do, whether you like work in a bank or <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, yeah because and, a and you could be a philosophy plumber. Absolutely. Well, they say some of the best plumbers are. Right. Like, <laughs> what makes you, what makes you think they don't want to think? I yeah, mean, well, that's really prejudice. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. You get philosophical about it. You know, <laughs> that's true. Maybe head off problems in the future because mm-hmm. if you shut up with your thinker on instead that's of it. just focusing on what they told you about. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So there, there's there's a group of people in power right now who think we don't need the humanities or that we're sucking away too much money. And my experience in prison is you cannot get enough of that because the recidivism is the mechanical, mindless, just, I mean, there's other issues too where, for example, when you get out, you, you are not eligible for food stamps, you're not eligible for welfare. Um, you yeah. probably don't have an education, so you don't qualify for the jobs. Um, Tennessee is trying to do this movement, ban the box. You guys familiar with that? Um, there's a box on most work applications, and you might have not noticed it if you're not a felon, you just go right over it. But it asks if you've been convicted of a felony. And if you're a felon, you have to check yes. And the vast majority of employers just take those applications and put them straight in the garbage. So it's virtually impossible to get a job because you are required by law to out yourself. It's, it's literally something out of Les Mis, like Jean Valjean with his paper show. <laughs> you know, um, they have to, you can't go to work at McDonald's without telling them you're a felon. And so the ban the box movement is saying, like, we really need to have that on an application. There's some jobs, obviously, like if you're working with children, they should do a background check and make sure that you haven't been convicted of child molestation. Like that's that's important. Um, but there are some jobs where I, I don't think that that's the kind of thing it's anybody's business necessarily. Mm-hmm. Or you should already have decided you're gonna hire somebody and then do the background check. And then, you, then you're in this position of, do I wanna give up this person I've already decided I wanted to hire for this? Because it's easy to throw applications in the pot in a trash if you don't know those people. But if you've already decided somebody's good for your business mm-hmm. and you find out they were convicted of theft once 20 years ago, you know, and they've been good ever since, you might be willing to overlook that because you've already got the commitment that this is the person you need. Whereas if you throw it away right away, no chance. So, yeah. um, I'm about to say is uh, just my opinion. That's fine. Observation, so don't mean to offend anyone. Okay. Uh, 
I believe that uh, humanity started with spirituality. Mm -hmm. A small group of men got together and said, let's make it a religion. Mm -hmm. And there have been groups of people, men and women, who get together who create a control structure. Mm -hmm. So one, one aspect in society is this structure of control, which does seem to want to uh, put dumb people down, mm -hmm. keep them in fear, keep them in strife, keep them in struggle, keep them in misunderstanding, misinformation. It just appears that way. Could be completely accidental. I might be misreading. I, sh I share that perception. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you have uh, the spiritual thing, which says, uh, you know, we're all soul, we're all spirits, and we're all pure energy. So, in, in, and I'm not religious, I am spiritual. So I believe that there's one creative source for all of us. So that's why all men created equal. Mm -hmm. um, I love your neighbor the way you love yourself mm -hmm. and do no harm. So when we get back to this thing of virtue, I believe that uh, people are I in harmony at a certain cycle of their spiritual or soul development. So this goes uh, to the, the Hindu philosophy of reincarnation, right? right? It's not your first time here, it's not your last time here. And you may be other places that you go as well. So in terms of uh, people are born with uh, infinite potential, but mm -hmm. they're also born based on their evolution, their growth. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, every, everyone here would fight to the death to defend their loved ones, their mm -hmm. child, their spouse, something like that. So the right circumstance can bring up that behavior, right. but to do it without that motivation, you know, it's like, for example, the, these control control structures. Why are they doing it? Now that is a little insidious. It, I I ask that all the time. Why right. are they? Like, what is? Why and then so here? some of those people are called sociopaths. Right. Yeah, it's a more dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, the others are just from fear, ignorance, lack of understanding, misinformation. Mm -hmm. You know, but the potential for greatness and the potential for disaster is within everybody. Mm -hmm. It's just where are you in that in that vibration? And so that goes back for me to a state of consciousness. So someone who 20 years ago stole the candy bar and now that follows them around their whole life, well clearly they could still be that person who stole the candy but bar. But they haven't shown it in 20 years. But so they may not be that person who stole yeah. the candy bar. So, But that label is like, uh, it's like a, uh, a brand Yes. You know, that's stuck on them. So they're not allowed to change. They're going to be viewed the same. Yeah. So they have all that energy being projected on them that you're still that, even though. It's almost like clogging the cycle of, of, of growth, growth mm -hmm. and expansion. So, anyway, those are just two thoughts in that direction. You brought up the, the, uh, you, you, uh, what you said about control structures. I, I kind of buy that, but I, I'm thinking. As soon as you said that, I was thinking of the Constitution of the United States, which is a control structure, mm -hmm. but it anticipated evil. Yes. So it put checks and balances, and that's a and for me that's a good control structure. Well, I, I mean, would, it, I would it's not it, except mm -hmm. that it's been corrupted. It's been exactly. Distorted. So there's an imbalance. Yeah. You can't, mm -hmm. I, from my perspective, cannot say that these balances are effectively functioning. Mm -hmm. And and there's but all kinds. But of they could. But, yeah. but they could function. They, though they could very well function with virtuous people. Exactly. Right. Because what are they adhering to? Yeah, but Words on a piece but of paper. They're, they're anticipating unvirtuous people, and they're trying to control a viable yeah. evolution with unvirtuous people. Yeah. If we look at other cultures, uh, uh, Aboriginal cultures, Native American cultures, leaders were selected a certain way. Yeah. In this country, if you look at people putting it, get, getting into positions of trust, yeah. whether he's a Boy Scout leader, a priest, or a politician, what's the process? He fills out an application and pays a fee, and then goes around telling you what he thinks you want to hear. Uh, there's a facade going on. Mm -hmm. And so it's about looking beyond the smoke and the mirrors, and, and, and the actions speak louder than the words. So yeah, to, that's an interesting point. I was just thinking about that, that it's what people do. And so this gets back to the habits. Yeah. Aristotle's thing about um, we can act, what is it, what is it, Toby? We can't necessarily think our way into good acting, but we can act our way into the good, good thinking. thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> That's so good. So if we actually do the right thing, and it also made me think about the white zone in your original Oh, yeah, the people who are, who are 
anything from yet. Pre Paris, yeah. right? There's there's um, still the potential is there for good, for evil, whatever. Yeah. And and so to be able to provide structures that foster the transmission of values and behaviors and give people the opportunity to do the, to learn to do the right thing. Yeah. And that's the com I loved your mercy thing in the very, very beginning. Oh yeah. yeah. Because if we don't I mean it's like with your kids, they're gonna screw up and they're gonna really make you mad. Yeah. Because they were because they're children spirited and yeah. self centered. And See, this is the experience I've had with children. So like like I know you said like babies are, are wonderful, but like I've also seen like pretty young children do really awful things. So I'm 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 on the fence. The verdict's not right, but we the jury's out for that. Yeah. Because, you know, grant them the opportunity to reform themselves. That's right. To grow in consciousness and all these other things. So it takes a certain amount of mercy, I think, in a in a justice system, which is something that we're gonna need to have. You bring up up ideas of pre they call them I call it pre college courses in philosophy and critical thinking. Oh yeah. We don't have that in many schools. Our high schools do not And do you, do you know why we don't have that? Uh, I think I think yeah you tell me what your suspicion is but it's right. Well, critical thinking. We don't want critical thinking. Do you want your teenagers arguing with you more? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think Joe's right. And, and, and actually, this is why my students, I, take, I teach my philosophy students philosophy, and then I say, what are your favorite lessons? And then they go into the Juvenile Detention Center, and they teach it to them. And one of the reasons why we've been doing it exclusively in the Juvenile Detention Center, or mostly in the Juvenile Detention Center, is because I cannot get a school to let me in. I have, the only schools I've been in are the ones where I have an undergrad who went to that school who has like an English t teacher who loves them to pieces and will let them into that. Because if you call up an elementary school or a middle school or a high school and you say, I want to teach them philosophy, they're like, yeah, we'll get back to you. And you never hear from them again. It, they are terrified of you, you know, basically giving them all these crazy ideas of independence and, you know, and it's the control. So when you mentioned, you mentioned control and you mentioned the, the Constitution as a good control. I think there's a difference between like structure and guidance and then control. And I think a lot of it has to do with the intent, right? Like, are you trying to control people so you can have your way with them? Or are you trying to guide people to be the best version of themselves? There's, there, there, yeah. Congratulations, thank you. Because everyone, <laughs> has, everyone has the right to strive to be the very best ver yeah. version of themselves, to cultivate themselves as a gentleman or as a lady. Right. And then live their life now again. Do no harm. You want to hurt yourself? Well, it's yourself, but you don't yeah. have the right to hurt anybody else. You see, so yeah. there's a tremendous amount of conformity going on, which is taking away the creativity and the imaginative capability, the, the infinite imaginative capability that we all come into. You know, no one says that in a society, uh, if you're part of this party or that party, you're the only people with answers. Right. <laughs> answers can come from anywhere and every, anyone. But it, it is this thing of uh, control, and when we lose that, uh, you know, a man sometimes thinks he must control and dominate the woman. Uh, the parent seems to think he must control and dominate the child. Uh, you know, it's all we, we can see all those control and dominance relationships in society. Well, I think all of them are flawed. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, and and guidance is kind of a paradoxical thing, right? Because you you are sort of telling people what to do. But you also want them to choose it themselves. And you know, it, 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 it's kind of like, the, it's a part of the human condition, part of the problem is that you want to make your kids do the right thing so that they will now choose to do the right thing. And, and it's like, when do those training wheels come off? When do we stop imposing and when do we, you know? And, and also, the, the creativity allows them to do different right things in different ways that are also permissible and right and good. Yeah. You know, so it's not like there's just one, you know, so, so you want that creativity. You don't want it to be anarchy. So you gotta have, you gotta have like those, those like you said with the constitution, like the, the guidelines and the boundaries. Um, and that, that I think is unfortunately the, the problem that we all face is you know, how much, because you, you should conform a little, but not like unthinkingly. Yeah. When you look at the incarceration, then you're looking at people who have done harm. Well, but mostly. Mostly. mostly, mostly, <laughs> mostly in theory. Some of them in have, theory. yeah. Yeah. In theory. And some of them have done harm to themselves, and oh, that's yeah. it. Oh, absolutely. They're there because absolutely. they use drugs. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But uh, e even then, get to the root of it, get to the cause of it. Everything's a symptom. We're treating symptoms, oh, we're yeah. not treating causes. There's a reason. Wow, you are, you are far more optimistic than I am. <laughs> 
I don't think they're treating symptoms at all. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think you're being a little too harsh on the education system. Okay. You talked for 41 years, mostly high school. Yeah. I was an art teacher, an art yep. history teacher. I know a lot of people that teach critical thinking, whether they're a drama teacher or a history mm -hmm. teacher or an English teacher. Sure. And it begins in kindergarten. Well, and, and I, I think that your students are very lucky. And I do th I'm do. i not saying that you don't have critical thinking. I, I didn't mean to imply that. It's just that there's a certain kind of critical thinking that you're capable of at a certain age that it's just it's just the way humans develop. We, we take a long time to grow. Like, like, we're in the oven all day, aren't we? You know, I mean, so, so what I'm thinking is, you know, you get, and when I say critical thinking, I'm saying compared to what the education offered in the prison is. I'm not comparing it to what you're doing. I'm talking about you can get your GED, you can learn how to like make a, like a, an engine for a car. You can learn how to be a barber. Like that's it. So what I'm saying is that the educate people are talking about, well, the prisoners do get education. And I'm saying, well, they're not getting the enough variety and they're certainly not getting the kind that you're giving even the fifth graders, right? So, I mean, they're getting to taught how to do stuff to make money because everything in America, everybody thinks is about money. Everything is about, we want you to know how to build an engine so you can get a job that you probably aren't gonna get because you have to check a box and they're gonna throw your application away. And then you're gonna be mad about it and have no emotional intelligence to deal with it. Yeah. And I was just gonna say that <coughs> I, I believe that the majority of teachers, the vast majority of teachers are outstanding teachers. Yeah, good, it, good, it's, hard teachers. it's a saintly profession. I think really what we would comment though is the administration and the funding I mean, you can only do so much when you have 40 kids in a room. I mean, the teacher has to have multiple jobs or too many students. I mean, it's yeah. the funding, and all of that is controlled. My mother was a high school administrator <coughs> for um, 34 years. She is the best person I ever knew in my whole life. And when she died, her um, memorial was three hours over time because every student she ever had was mm -hmm. lined up around the corner. Um, so I, I, I know what you're saying, and I'm, so, I'm sorry I implied anything different, because I know that you're right. Um, but we need more of that, that kind of thinking, and at the adult level for people in prison, because they don't get it. And you also have to remember all the posing that goes, you don't want to get beat up or shanked, right? So, I mean, the guys cannot show compassion and emotion, and it, it's just, it's like this social structure that it's, it makes you look weak. But in their philosophy class, they're allowed to say, well, hypothetically, let's pretend I care about other people. And then, you know, then, they, then they're allowed to for three hours with my students, and it's not uncool, and it doesn't, you know, nobody's gonna get in a brawl over it later. Yeah. I guess, uh, so where my mind is going with all this is, is the, the, the high-minded philosophies, the, the fly that tends to get in the ointment is this tendency towards Greed yeah. and power, uh -huh. and people who are in, in one of the seven sin, sins, and people who are greedy, it's never enough. That's right. And the people that I've um, been in a relationship with that I can't get away from who show this greed, they never can get enough power. And the more power they have, the more they aspire to put themselves into a position where they are above reproach. Yes. No matter what. So they can keep and then philosophy doesn't matter anymore. Ah, so for them or for society? Because well, it infects society because it's every. Oh person. sure, I guess what I'm what I'm saying is Aristotle would say that you're talking about a thoroughly vicious person, which is what I did actually still believe from that article that I wrote. That once you get to that point, arguments aren't going to work on you, and Aristotle says that. Arguments are not going to work on you. And here's what's really tough. Yeah. And this is what brings up the motto, the same motto, to be rather than be seen. Yeah. A lot of these people who are like this yeah. are just the nicest people you ever want to be with. Well, they, are, they aren't. Them. They aren't, though. You yeah. think they are. Like, well, that's just <laughs> the same. Like, yeah. To be rather than to seem. You know, it, it, right. Actions will lead out. Right. You know, beyond 
how they seem. And unfortunately, you have to get hurt by them a few times before you recognize that exactly. the difference. Yeah. So right. But yeah, but you know what though? I think I believe that the people who get the humanities education, the critical thinking, and the philosophy are going to be the ones that are going to see it faster. Get underneath all yeah, and, and, and see the virtues. Right, the and, and they'll know, and they'll be able to because they'll they'll catch contradictions in what people say and what they do, mm -hmm. and they'll want people to be held accountable, and they'll have arguments for why people have to be held accountable because they'll have studied justice, you know, <laughs> um, and I don't just mean like the criminal justice system, but like what is fairness, what is you know what makes something a, a good society, um, and so I definitely think that we will always have people in society like that. There will always be people that, for whatever reason, their energy is going in a bad way. But if we can set up structures, and I'm thinking educational structures, that make the majority of us at least attuned to knowing when something's going wrong and having the will and the practice to do something about it, then we can really minimize it. That's why I actually put minimizing in the, because I, I have no, I have no you know, dreams of being able to make everything perfect, you know I mean? The older yeah. I get, the more I realize that's just not going to happen. <laughs> you know, in terms of virtue, it's uh, having the motivation to to, to uh, oh, the, the motivation of having the perception that I'm in power or control, or I'm being of service. And the, the people who who tend to, and I hate to use that term top, who, but who tend to be in positions of public trust, they're there for ulterior motives. You know, but right, the, instead the, of the, being the, a position of service. Yeah, yeah. They, what they seem is, oh, I really care, but that's not what they're being. So this is this is a question then. Um, if we believe that all politicians are corrupt, for example, or all business people are corrupt, for example, how do we motivate young people to make the effort to do the hard thing and be a virtuous politician or a virtuous businessman? What do you guys think? But if you start with that premise, of corruption, you won't ever. You are. You won't figure it out because you they, don't think so. they're not all corrupt. Right. Well, I do I think they're not. You, but I'm saying if there's, but I think that's true. <laughs> that no, that is exactly right. That 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 you know, pe people. You are you are so right. You don't even know how important what she just said yeah, is. Yeah, what, what's your name, ma'am? What's your name, ma'am? Evelyn. 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 Bo you're gonna laugh. Both my grandmothers were named Evelyn. I love that name. Um, <laughs> like seriously, it's a, it's not that common, and both of them had it. Um, Evelyn, um, what you just said is so right because one of the problems that we have that we, that I teach in my Why Are Bad People Bad class is that we have this view that people that are bad are these vicious monsters that you can see a mile away. They're snarling and they've got all sorts. <laughs> you know, they're pointing out at you just because you're there. Um, you, you know, and it turns out that the people are complicated, that very few people are just thoroughly vicious, and the ones that are thoroughly vicious got there because they're good at hiding it, right? Um, and then the people who are just like not thoroughly vicious, but pretty rotten, like like they, they got a lot of work to do, they're not rotten all the time. I mean, it's exhausting to be bad all the time. Even, if, you know, I mean, very few people can maintain that. So even if they hurt people, it's usually out of laziness, not out of effort. You know? What about this effort idea, though? About yeah. How do we encourage people to brush shoulders knowingly with people who are who are not virtuous, let's say? Because being a virtuous around virtuous people is easy, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, even criminals are mm -hmm. kind to their friends, a wise man once said. So yeah. you, you see what I'm saying? So, it, but there's effort involved, and to motivate yeah. young people to stand up. And I mean, my daughter's very, very much against the death penalty. Yeah. Right? she woke up to in, in high school. And I've had this fantasy that she might grow up to be an advocate against the death penalty, but you know, that's a lifestyle which requires a certain je ne sais quoi. Right. And well, so I'm just curious about the effort part. I want to tell you something I tell my students. Um, my students, I don't have children, and my students will are, are in a state where it's popular to be like, taxes is like slavery, and I'm like, yeah. Um, so, um, my students will say, doesn't it bother you that you pay taxes for your neighbor's kids to go to school? And I said, no, because my neighbor's kids are at my grocery store and at the church and in my classroom, and I have to live with these people, right? 
And so I want them to be educated and good and decent because I don't feel like living by myself in the woods being a beast or a god, as Aristotle would say. So what you say to them is, look, what kind of society do you want to live in? And if this is a society you've got, wouldn't it be worth the effort to make it better if you can, even a little bit? And the only way, it starts with you. You have to, you have to be the change that you want to see in the world, as Gandhi says, right? Yeah, it starts with you. But you, as an example, can be infectious. Other people can start to do things like you. This is something that is interesting about the Stanley Milgram experiments. They have redone, done them over and over again with different adjustments because they're actually hard on the people that, that they do them to. But um, they found that if you have a person next to two other people who are saying, no, I don't want to do it, that that person is far more likely to say no. I won't do something wrong. Mm -hmm. And so if you know that there are two people in the room that also disagree with something bad that's going on, mm -hmm. you'll happily be the third. People are afraid to be the first or the second. Mm -hmm. But in that, and we're seeing this today, right? We're seeing all these movements coming out, movements about you know Black Lives Matter, movements about gun control, movements about the opioid epidemic. You know, enough people start to say, this isn't cool, I'm not going to stand for it. And then all of a sudden, it's okay to join them. You just don't want to be first. It's so hard to be first. Mm -hmm. It's about critical mass. So if you say to our students, and again, humanities, and, and, and also just education in general, you say to them, what kind of society do you want to live in? And you also have to be honest with them, which is really hard for people. Maybe this is why I don't have kids, because it's really easy for me. My brother hates me so much when I tell his... I tell, I tell my niece and nephew stuff that I'm not supposed to because like they ask, <laughs> they like ask me questions and yeah, like, 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 like my niece when she's 12 asks me things like about genocide. So I tell her, you know, my brother's like, she's gonna have nightmares. I'm like, but it's a thing and she should know about it, <laughs> you know? Um, but we need to be more honest with our students, with our, with our kids because if you tell them how rotten the world is and then tell them that we need you to be the change, I have never seen hope and energy like you see in kids. Like they have not been beaten down yet. Mm -hmm. And if you tell them everything's great, then they're just gonna play video games. They have nothing to do. Mm -hmm. Maybe they need to know things aren't great. Maybe we need to stop sheltering them. Oh, I agree completely. Not only rebel against you. <laughs> well, that's fine, because if, if I'm the problem, do it, rebel against me. Yeah. You know, uh, but yeah, you're right. You're right. That, that whole thing, well, let me get control. Um, so society is a reflection of quote unquote leadership. I'm gonna use that term loosely. Yeah. Um, so if you want a virtuous society, have virtuous leaders. And they uh, may be elected or they may be people who are in charge of a movement. They might, you know. You know, people who are and again not leaders, but people who are chosen at the time to to make decisions on behalf of the people. So it should show for example, uh, an office or a uniform does not make a person virtuous. No it does not. You see. Yeah. Um, our our country's office of president, I mean there have been plenty of men there who are not virtuous. Right. Seems like they're they're running a competition, yeah. Yeah, so it, it's not that it's the person. So it doesn't behoove them to have critical thinking, virtuous, right acting people because that type of population is hard to control and dominate. Because they're and going to see, control. I want to live in a good society, and they're going to try to stop you. And so, and in a lot of ways, I can say this is always my indication, and of course there are, in there are differences, right? Some people do it unknowingly. But if you want people to think and learn and be critical, and if you want people to go to the polls and vote, then you actually want them to participate and you want them to be better. And if you don't want them to think and you don't want them to learn and you don't want them to come to the polls and vote, it's because you don't want them to be better and you don't want them to be involved and you don't want them to be part of the process. And, and again, when you look at the funding of, of the schools, and when you look at where America was in education to where America is in yeah. education today, it's a stark contrast. I mean, it's fallen, yeah. it's fallen hard. And, yeah. uh, and then the other thing you didn't bring up, which is also a matter of control, uh, is the, the, the makeup of people who are incarcerated. Oh, it's in so racially biased. Black, it's awful. And brown. It's so, and it's, and it's not just, it, there's that, but it's also the, the duration of the sentences, too. So, oh, right, right, right. so my, my student, Twilight, who, who negotiated the ceasefire between gangs in Nashville and goes around publicly speaking now, he was a really bad person in the 80s. And, um, and I'm blanking for a second with 
just say the last thing you said, I wanted to bring it up. Uh, just the racial makeup. Right, of so he had a regional sentence of 242 years. He was not convicted of murder. Can you guess what his race is? Just think about that. He was not convicted of murder or rape. I mean, he did some really bad things. It was like armed robbery and assault and battery and they took every single one and lined it up and he definitely, he tells me that he deserved to be locked up for a long time. Maybe not 242 years. But, you know, my husband likes to point out, my husband grew up in Rochester, New York. Um, and um, there is a serial killer there and I'm blanking on his name. Does anybody know the guy from Rochester? He was very bad. Um, was he caught? Yes, twice. He's white. He killed two children, went to jail for like 10 years, got out, and then killed my prostitute. And it's, I can't believe I'm blanking on the name. No. Um, but uh, yeah, he's white. He actually murdered while assaulting children. And I think he was in jail for like 15 or 15 years. <coughs> but. <coughs> Well, yeah, well, that, actually, that one might have just been they were trying to make it bad with him. But you're right, though, there, there is that, too, because especially. And, and it's the discretion of the prosecutor, not the judge. Yes. And, it's, uh, and, and, and the prosecutor has um, a power base to speak to, and they, they also want to be elected. Mm -hmm. And what did I so say early about how Americans really love retribution? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe so they popular just that. I think so. Because forgiveness is a great It is. And also, you know, it's really interesting to me. There's so many things I learned teaching in prison. Um, believe it or not, murder is the crime that you are the least likely to reoffend. Very few people who are who have killed somebody are serial killers. Like like that's a that's a totally different kind of animal, right? Mm -hmm. So most people who've killed somebody, it was a really awful, awful situation, probably involved being drunk or on drugs, definitely had had emotional anger, you know, issues involved, right? And in it, on top of that, I'm told killing somebody really leaves a mark on you. Like, like you, your life is never the same. Like, like if you have a conscience, if you're not a sociopath, um, that person will never do it again. And we, our punishments are based on the severity of the crime, not on the danger to society. Because if somebody kills somebody, you put them away for life and expect them to die in prison, and that's the person that, you know, you punish them, sure, I'm not saying don't punish them, right? But if you punish them, say, for 15 years, like they do in England, and they get out and they'd be perfectly fine members of society. Meanwhile, somebody who routinely rapes children goes to jail for what, like three years, and then comes out, and you know that that is the crime that people repeat. There are some crimes that have far more chance of, you know, of, of being a recidivism issue. Believe it or not, murder is very rarely repeated. So other people have written, for example, judges. Mm -hmm. uh, there are laws being written that are taking away their ability to judge. Yeah. They're being forced to do things. And I don't and know how I feel about it. And they're called your honor. Well, I can't refer to them as your honor because you're not using your judgment because you're the person in front of the person yeah. who did it. You must yeah, be judged. I know, it's so hard because we did let them judge though and look what they did, right? So I, I don't know the answer. I mean, because again, we get this, they're not virtuous, right? You're putting the wrong people there in the beginning. Just a quick question, yeah. what's the name of your article there so where we can find it? Sure, it, um, the one that I'm talking about today is called Breaking the Habit, How Aristotle Might Think a Thoroughly Vicious Person Could Improve. Um, and my cards are up there. I have an academia.edu site where I have it up there. You are also going to want to notice when you go up there that I have a paper on justice and mercy because you mentioned oh mercy. Sure. And I, yeah, that's also, I, I, like I said, I, I give away for free. I, <laughs> you don't do philosophy for the big bucks. Uh, <laughs> and it's surprising how hard it is to give it away for free, like I said. But the Jewel Intention Center, we got really lucky there. There was a, there was a teacher there who was just awesome and she gave us a standing invitation. Once a week, she's like, you can have my class. Mm -hmm. So I have an undergrad go down, and it's a mile from my office. It's very close. Walk down to the Juvenile Intensive Center and teach philosophy once a week. And those kids, here's my theory. Tell me what you guys think about this. I think being a teenager, if I remember correctly, the experience is 
your responsibilities increase far at a far faster rate than do your rights. Which is why teenagers are always saying everything's not fair. Mm -hmm. It's not fair that I have to do this chore, it's not fair that I have a curfew because I don't get to do anything. And when you think about it, that's kind of true, right? Because we make them prove themselves first, which they haven't, they haven't done anything wrong yet, right? So they act out. And they act out as a protest to be subversive. But they're teenagers and they haven't been taught philosophy because <laughs> We, uh, we could because we deprive them. And so they go tag buildings and break stuff, right? Well, I'm encouraging my students to teach philosophy in the juvenile detention center, because I think if you teach juvenile offenders philosophy, you're giving them an intellectual safe way to lash out. It doesn't hurt anybody. And it's one of the reasons why I'm very grateful to my mother, who was the English teacher, who always got her way and I ended up doing the right thing anyway, but she would pretend to listen to my argument. Like she would let me argue with her about why I thought it wasn't fair or right um, because she wanted me to be a critical thinker. And there might be like one or two times I won, but like really it was an exercise, <laughs> like, you know? But she encouraged that and the fact that she heard me, I didn't feel like I had to do anything else. It was like, well, at least I tried, she listened. Yeah. I think so much of it, um, why it's important just to build their self-esteem. Like yeah. I, have, I have such radically different um, parents. Like my dad is very much a, well, I'm your father, so that's why you should do it. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas, um, and it's his mom. Um, <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> so so you did good. <laughs> would engage with me a little more. Occasionally I heard the, well, I'm your parent thing. Because eventually <laughs> that <laughs> is where the buck stops. You yeah. know, every time that yeah. you want to engage, you're, not, you're just going to just fall through. Well, I'm, because I'm your parent. But yeah, that um, can't be the first answer. Yeah. Right, but it's so important um, because it builds your self-esteem and your critical thinking, and it gives, because um, I know there's been a few issues that my mom um, has had a really strong opinion, and I was just like, you're be you're not thinking clearly about this. Like, you're really um, emotionally charged about this, and it's not, it's coming from something else, and I was actually able to change her mind. That's right. And I think that's so important as a small child that you're like, oh, wow. Okay. Like talking, So reasoning and thinking somewhere. are important. Yeah. They do actually make a difference. <laughs> yeah. Talking gets somewhere and you know, I'm you present yourself. You learn how to present your, your arguments, your feelings. And you learn and to, to challenge important. the perception of authority. You That's have right. the right to in a speak respectful up. way. In a respectful way. Right. You have the right to voice everyone has a right to their opinion. That's what everyone can agree yeah. to disagree, like dislike, yeah. but they That's still right. have the right to it. Right. 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 I love teasing in prison because it is one of the only times I know everybody did the reading. Really? Yeah. It's, it's amazing social manipulation, I admit. So <laughs> the guys, most of them do not have a college degree. So they are terrified of my college students. They're afraid they're all going to come in and be know-it-alls and they don't want to look stupid because the worst thing you can do is look stupid in prison, right? So when I give them work, and, and again, it's not like they have nothing better to do. They're all working like 10 hour days. They will, like during the, the yard time, you know, they'll read and they'll talk about it. They'll, they'll, the, one time I caught them, I found out, you know, one of them had asked something and somebody else says, that's not how you're supposed to ask it. And I'm like, what are you? And it turned out that they had come up with a bunch of questions they were gonna ask and they each assigned each other like one question so that way they could get all the answers and nobody had to look too stupid asking all the questions. And they had done this beforehand, right? And so they're so worried about looking bad in front of my students that they over prepare and they come like they come to learn and then my college kids who start to realize that they have it pretty good and that you know and, and, they, and they usually say in like the second or the third week they're like oh I feel so bad that I get to go home and they don't you know mm -hmm. and every time we say goodbye we always say goodbye and know that it might be the last time because if somebody gets written up they can't come back mm -hmm. um, you know and they can be written up for putting their towel in the wrong place I mean it's been named what happens um, and so then my undergrads start to realize that they're slacking off and 
looking kind of kind of <laughs> kind of lazy in front of the guys and so then they kick up their game and about by the third week of any semester everyone's done everything I've asked and it's like a teacher's joy I cannot explain <laughs> I, I wish I could teach all of my classes in prison <laughs> yeah no it, it, it's wonderful and they really appreciate it unfortunately when you're in a position like being in prison lots of things you take for granted are very quickly seen as precious. Yeah. Did you teach at women's prison or did you really? I have not yet. I'm going to. Um, I, I'm working on this project with my husband. He actually taught in the prison for me while I was here this year because I'm on sabbatical. And now we've got a bunch of professors interested. And so now that we can maybe like move around, I might, you know, I've got my, I've got my prison, but I also, all prisons in Nashville are in the same place. The thing about women's prison, which I guess is a good thing, is there are fewer of them. So there's only one women's prison in Tennessee, which I thought was amazing, because there are you know, dozens of them. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that I don't know anything about that I encourage you to research about gender and, and crime. Um, but the women's prison tends to have a lot of people, like, like who you were saying, a lot of people there there for drugs or prostitution or what have you. Um, it might be that there's, I tend to think it's about socialization, and I think that maybe we should think about some of the things that we, we socialize women for and just start doing it for everybody, because it seems to be working for women. Um, maybe not the bad self-esteem thing, because that, that has to go. Um, but yeah, I have not taught in women's prison, and I'm actually very eager to, because I wonder if it's different. Because when you said, you know, men are about caring their feelings for themselves, I wonder how it would be from the other perspective. I don't know. I, I imagine that it's probably not as taboo to show that you care, but still, like, you know, it, 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 it's almost, if you guys know about Philip Zimbardo's experiments, the prison, the Stanford prison experiments, um, this happened in the 70s where these young undergrads were told that they were going to pretend to be prisoners and guards in this experiment, and it was supposed to last two weeks, they had to cancel it after six days because people got in their role so much that they were, like, the guards were abusing the prisoners, it's like, it was amazing. Um, and so the theory that he has is that a lot of times we subconsciously like lean into the role we have, right? And so I am doing my armchair philosophy thing. I have no evidence to say what I'm about to say. But I imagine that because of the way prisons are run, and I'm sure women's prisons are run similarly, um, you can imagine that people are put in this role where they're expected to be tough and they're expected not to care. So they might have that at least initially and it might be that they only open up to some people after a while. It's certainly not like my philosophy class where the first day I tell everybody to get to know each other and we're all gonna learn and it's gonna be, you, you know, we're gonna be a family, you know, <laughs> you know like, like, like they, they start just telling you all sorts of stuff you don't wanna know. Um, so I think, I think the setting matters. So I, I don't know, I'm curious and, and I wish I could get back to you when I do it. Um, I would like to think it's more warm but I don't know if, if if the setting, if the structure is there to not be warm, lots of people will not be warm. And it's also about dehumanization. Uh, I just had a yes. question for your presentation earlier in your unscientific results yes. or guesses or estimates or whatever they were. Um, the, the bit about the percentage of people, or the rough mm -hmm. number, Yes. In the prison population. Yeah. How did you arrive at that? Oh, um, the unscientific uh, answer is I figured if they were continent, then they, they were not guilty. Uh -huh. So so the idea is that they probably knew what to do, they yeah. did the right thing, and so if they're in prison, they were wrongly convicted. And so basically. No, I didn't have any problem with that, those small percentages. Right. But you, you oh, you meant in the, in the general population? Yes. Oh. Well, well, that Aristotle tells us, and, and this is more, not, it's not my estimation, it's my guess of what Aristotle would say. Aristotle tells us that the vast majority of human population, this is his opinion, is between continents and incontinence, most of us leaning towards the bad one. And so I decided to make it slightly more than 50% be the two of them, and then the incontinent be slightly more than the continent. That's where I came up with that, to, to try to represent that. And also because I think vice is rare 
thankfully. Virtue is unfortunately rare. And then those are the only two others I have. So they make up the rest. Did I see a hand? I thought I did. Gosh, thank you guys. Yes, tell me more. Oh, no, thank God, no. No, there definitely are others, and I can, I can send Joe links. There is, um, there is a website about teaching philosophy in prison. Uh, the, the, the program that I got trained in is absolutely wonderful. There's this um, woman, Lori Pompa, um, and she started Inside Out, which is the bringing the kids in, uh, at Temple University maybe 25 years ago. And now Inside Out is international, it's everywhere. And I went to Temple University to be trained as an Inside Out instructor um, because there's a lot of problems that come with bringing undergrads into a prison. For, and, and it's all undergrad related. <laughs> like, it's nothing to do with it. It, it. I have to tell them like, you can't just forget that your cell phone's in your back pocket when you go through maximum security, you will be arrested. You know, like, like, like no, nobody's gonna care that you didn't mean to accidentally bring contraband in and go, I love my undergrads because they're very ditzy. Um, I mean, it's just that age, you know. No offense to anyone that might be that age in that room. Just, you'll grow out of it. It's okay. You'll grow out of it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, but uh, if you're interested in that, you can Google inside out prison teaching. Um, and I believe if you have a master's, you can teach any, you can teach a, a college level class in that field. Um, and if you're volunteering, I think I should probably let you do whatever you want. It's free, right? You know. So um, yeah, so there's a lot of that. But most of the people that do that are actually criminologists. Most of the people are teaching criminology inside prison. Yeah. Philosophy is is not. I, I know the book you're talking about because I think if it is the same one, is it in Louisville? Mm -hmm. they, so. they, have, they have Shakespeare behind bars in Louisville in, in Kentucky uh, where every year, and it is, you can actually go on YouTube and see some of it. They actually were given permission to record it, which is amazing. It's really hard to get cameras inside. Um, and every year they put on a Shakespeare performance and they are like rated better than some Broadway performances. I mean, they, they are really, really good at what they do. Um, and you have to actually go into the prison, obviously, to see it, because they, they're they indisposed. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, that's wonderful. We need more of it. Yeah, so there's uh, Shakespeare Behind Bars, Inside <coughs> Out, um, Philosophy in Prisons. We, the thing is that these are all people like me who just had an idea and maybe got a little too confident one moment and just asked if they could do it. And then there was some warden who was lazy and said, sure. <laughs> um, and that, that's why we're in there. Um, I think it should be, I mean, I mean, there are programs that are just, like therapy is pretty much in every prison. It should be, right? Alcoholics Anonymous is in every prison because there are so many people that need it. It's just automatic. I don't know why college classes aren't automatic. It should just be in prison. People should just, that should just be one of the things they do. I also want to tell you one quick thing that's sad, but I think it can be motivating to help us make the world a better place. So I learned something, I visited my husband's class, I taught my Justice and Mercy article there, and um, I learned that they started teaching the prisoners how to be farmers, because Tennessee, Kentucky, lots of farms, right? Mm -hmm. And they were very upset, and they said, what's the problem? And they said that they are forced to throw away all the produce that they harvest. And they have been, yes, they, are, they have been asking, can we please give it to, to you know, the cafeteria? If you don't want us to have it, can we give it to a food shelter? They, th the prison refuses because they got a grant to teach them how to farm, but it didn't specify in the grant that anybody had to eat what they farm. And so they literally make, they, they farm they, these like heads of lettuce and collard greens, and then they harvest them and they go in the garbage. And I thought about what I was saying today, and I was thinking, what a difference would it make if they knew that what they did went to a homeless shelter or fed underprivileged children? And wouldn't that inspire them to do it more? And wouldn't that actually be, and, and if they could 
maybe get a letter from a church or something that said thank you for doing this. It, that's their cookie. That's their cookie, yeah, that's right. 